Hello, I'm Natalie from Genealogy Stories and welcome to Twice Removed, the show where we talk about everything history related. Today I'm joined by my guest Nick Barrett. Nick is a medieval historian by training, uh, but he's also a author, a broadcaster, and best known for his work on BBC's Who Do You Think You Are? Hi, Nick. Welcome to the first Genealogy Stories interview. Um, I was hoping today to talk to you a little bit about your own genealogy journey. So I was wondering what got you started tracing your own family tree? It's a really tricky question uh, because for many years, I suppose, it was always something I did for other people because of the work on who do you think you are and then running the agency. I didn't have an awful lot of time. It's feel like a bit like a busman's holiday, I suppose. And then I got the bug. Um, there were two strands that I guess got me really hooked. One was my great uncle, and I've, I've spoken about him at length in other places, but just to recap, um, he was unknown in the family. No clue about who he was. He died young. No one could remember him, so therefore he sort of dropped out. By chance, his name popped up in the National Archives Discovery Catalogue um, in a really intriguing place in the KV2 files, which was related to MI5. So Ooh. immediately you think, great, that's James Bond done, tick, fantastic. And then you look more closely and you realise he was under surveillance, not part of the oh, espionage team. Okay. And he was under surveillance because he was a suspected Soviet collaborator. So this file appeared and it's got phone intercepts when the surveillance was first put on him um, right the way through to his death, um, which then led to me investigating further about what he was up to and who he was associated with. So it turns out he'd been a foreign office official and at some point had fallen on harder times than he had perhaps anticipated and had tried to sell secrets to the Russians when he was based wow. in Paris. Um, and you've got this sort of two year cat and mouse between him and the Russian agents. And then once the Russians had got him, him and the British agents trying to work out what was going on until it appears as though he committed suicide. I say appears because there are some questions that remain unanswered about whether he died or whether someone bumped him off. So that was great to research um, and turn it into a book, Forgotten Spy. So it actually lent itself to a really compelling story but I guess that was more out of curiosity the really personal stuff I've been doing recently is investigating my illegitimate grandmother on my mother's side I think and I remember she, you mentioning her before she sounds really interesting she's oh she was a formidable character she <laughs> passed away a few years ago now over 10 years um but she she never said anything about her background she knew she was illegitimate but she was really sensitive about the subject so we couldn't ask her questions um, but we knew she had some photographs of these mysterious relatives. Um, one particular character that she called Aunt Dodo and okay. another one called Moraine. Now, we thought Moraine was just the name of a person. But of course, when you look at it and when you understand that she was born in Belgium, Moraine is grandmother. OK. Grandmother. So there, there, there was something there that was standing in plain sight. So if we'd run that through Google Translate, we would have had a far, a far easier time of it. Um, so we couldn't find a birth certificate anywhere and it was only in the last couple of years with some of the interest on the first world war commemorations that i hooked up with an academic who'd been looking into belgian birth certificates for refugees who'd come over and i just said yeah well i don't suppose you could run this name through the database and up it popped up popped my grandmother's name and it transcribed transpired that she had been born not where we thought in antwerp but actually in Knoch, which is a okay. small place frequented by the rich and famous um where her mother had gone over had her and then left her almost fostered her with a local family before then bringing her back at the start of the first world war not to live with the family but to be placed with a governess in a remote farmhouse in norfolk but finally through the certificate we had the names of her mother who turned yeah. out to be this aunt dodo uh, dorothy uh, gladys gillen and the name of her father henry victor fuller now, this chat was really interesting. He was a teacher or professor. Um, it claimed that he was born in Florence in Italy, but actually his mother had been based in Italy and he'd spent a lot of time there. And he was living in Minneapolis. So I tracked the guy down and he was a chemistry teacher. He'd been married before, left his wife and kid, moved to Europe, possibly had this relationship uh, with my great grandmother. 
picked up a French wife, ended up in China teaching in a university out there before coming as, back as and ending do. his days. <laughs> as you do, you know, you know, colourful life, ending his days in, in the States. So I thought, okay. fantastic. Investigated the Fuller family tree and got really excited when I found out that he was a Mayflower descendant. So there was just like this incredible story. Unfortunately, none of it is true. <laughs> we did a DNA test and we can't connect with any of it. I was and just going to say, did you do a DNA test? <laughs> well, don't, don't do DNA. It throws everything up in the air. No, genuinely, it was a really interesting experience having advised people to do DNA test kits and never knowing that I'd have to do some of that exploration myself. Yeah. And I spent the last few months just picking through the matches on 23andMe and Ancestry DNA, trying to triangulate where we think the father would have come from. And we've now got what we think is the likely family, the von Hotzendorfs. Erich, Erich von Hotzendorf, who's either Austrian or German, but came over just at the start of the First World War because he claimed to be the nephew of the general who advised um, Kaiser Wilhelm to go to war. Right. Great, great uncle, probably was the guy who started the First World War. Really okay. good family history here. I was going to say, so you've got an ancestor that started the First World War and another one that was a spy on the wrong side. Okay. Probably great. started the Cold War by accident. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. It just goes to show that you can, uh, you, you never know what you're going to find when you start looking, really. <laughs> well, yeah, it was a bit unexpected. And uh, there's lots of other really interesting yeah. folk as well. But isn't that the way, though, when you start researching your family, you're drawn to these colourful characters, these larger than life folk. Um, but of course, there are only two people. One isn't, I would call, a direct relative. Uh, the other is. But you're drawn to it. And, and in many ways, the harder the, the research, the more you want to spend time looking at it. Yeah, yeah. And but... I guess that's the addiction that anyone who's done any genealogy will face. I'm sure you've found something very similar. Definitely. You know, a lot of them, my family is okay, great, collected the name, collected the documents, and I've parked them on the family tree. I'll come back to them. But yeah, the, these compelling folk. If you could meet one of your ancestors, somebody you'd never met, do you have somebody that you'd pick or a couple? On, well, there's, there's a couple. On my mother's side again, um one of my ancestors worked at the british museum um completely flawed us because he came from a farming background and moved to london and pitched up as a curator at the british museum so having come from an archival background i think oh okay that's quite cool i like that i just want to have a chat about how he got into it how he moved from you know wiltshire to london and then got a job at the british museum and what was all that about because it was much harder in those days to pitch up and mm. claim expertise but i i would want to i would want to investigate who my um, great grandfather was? Yeah. Who was this mysterious character? Um, was it Erich von Hossendorf himself? Was it one of his relatives? We just don't know. I want to know what drove him from Germany at that time. Was it because he was ashamed of his family? He could see that war was coming. Um, what was the what was the thinking behind that migration, leaving all the friends and family behind, leaving your country behind, leaving? leaving Europe behind and then starting afresh with some of the challenges that he faced. And he, he had a pretty tricky life in the States. He ended up in prison for a little bit for a fraud and all sorts of things. There's a, there's a pattern here in my family here, <laughs> no, um, dodgy characters. But yeah, I want, to, I want to know. I just want to know why. why did, what, what happened? How did you meet my great grandmother? What were the circumstances? Um, just just tell us, you know. Yeah, no, I have the same in my tree. So my my, my great grand's illiterate, uh, illiterate, illegitimate. So have um, exactly the same curiosities and, uh, and and similar sort of treks down the whole DNA route. Um, but yeah, a, a little bit less colourful, more more Welsh bootmakers. But you know, <laughs> still fascinating. But isn't that the thing though? We say Welsh bootmakers, so I immediately want to know. Okay, so what was that like? What was it like? In that place in Wales, what was it? Is it a town, a rural setting, bootmaking, cobbling? You know, skill profession, lots of demand. What was the what was life like on that daily basis? And yeah. you know, what led to those circumstances? It really is uh, intriguing and frustrating in equal measures. Yeah, definitely. He, he the, the suspected chap seems to be. Um, it wasn't married at the time. Can't can't quite work out why he didn't stick around. But he seems to have got a bit of in a little bit of trouble with the law. Um, whereas the rest of his entire family emigrated to Canada. He was the only one that, that ended up staying here. So it sounds like he was a, a bit of a Jack the Lad, maybe, or maybe ostracised. It's really, Yeah, it's really, really intriguing. So, yeah, it's one I of think that's the thing, though. We, we can't help but speculate. Was he ostracised? How much did that have felt for him? You know, what did he feel if he found he's got someone pregnant? Was that sort of 
gulp of fear or did he not care or Th- those are the sorts of yeah. um reflections and conversations we, we can't help but impose on the past and you know obviously there's no way of knowing for certain but you do like to build them up in your mind's eye don't you just yeah, to assign definitely. those characteristics to them and just try and walk in their footsteps for a little bit definitely um and I just wondered whether you had a favourite historical period because we've talked about sort of war eras, but I know that you're actually a medieval historian as well. So I just wondered what your favourite historical period was, if you had one. Well, I would be, you know, I would be selling myself out if I didn't say the 13th century. Okay. Um, Because so much of the world around us today makes sense if you go back to the period between 1204 and 1216. 1204, when essentially... um, England and you know it the the lands around it were part of a much larger family dynastic territory and this huge rupture when King John lost all most of those lands and established himself essentially as the first what I would call true king of England from that period onwards because he was confined to this land that he spent very little time in before then it changed the course of history genuinely changed the course of European and British history. Everything that we think of today in terms of Brexit, devolution, um, some of the class structure challenges that we face, come back to that moment. The rule of law and liberty and assumptions around parliament come back to 1215, 1216, when we have Magna Carta, the um, definition that the king should not be above the law, that wise council should govern Um, above the king's prerogative all of it starts in that sort of 12 year period uh, which then extends into the later 13th century when we get Henry III John's son um, facing um, similar disruption and protest because of the way he'd governed the country and got involved with overseas stuff you know don't do overseas stuff that's not a good (laughs) thing focus on England you know that the argument we're having today you understand so much about the present if you go back to that period and that's where we get Simon de Montford civil war the birth of parliament the first representative parliament in 1264 65 you know great stuff there that's the period where we get um, the birth of democracy in the way that we know it today 13th century have I sold it to you? <laughs> yeah, no, you have. I don't know a lot about that period other than, uh, you know, a few podcasts that I've listened to about Eleanor um, of uh, Aquitaine. You know, I, I'm quite ignorant on that time period. So it's definitely something I need to to learn up on. I, I My favourite time period is the Victorians. So, and that kind of uh, late Georgian period as well. I just find that that industrialisation and that, that that change really fascinating so yeah I need to um I need to go back further I suppose putting my house history hat on I'd agree with that Georgian Regency Victorian period we get we get fantastic architecture but at a level that most people now can afford or live in and I think that's the moment where you you get communities being developed where architecture you know, considered architecture to construct spaces for people to live in really became mainstream and you, you know you, you have to look at that as, as, as a great improvement from what went before yeah oh, I found all the, as well with slums but really I was gonna say I find all the public health history and the um, the, the social reform that gradually came in and, and the forms of social control as well to a certain degree really interesting around that period so yes yeah, definitely definitely my favorite so have you managed to trace your own family history back to medieval times at all any 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 lucky uh you know unless you're related to royalty or, or very wealthy people it's quite difficult true or very unusual surnames yeah. and um there are some lines that go back certainly pre-18th century yeah and i picked at them but you know even though i'm passionate about medieval history for me it's not about how many names you can collect or how far back you go it's what you know about the people so i guess yes i've, I've as we've all done we've played around with ancestry and find my past and family search and my heritage and all the other ones and just tried to push the family tree back and I've got names and I've got places and I've got dates and I've got baptisms and marriages and all of the paraphernalia that we use to provide that connectivity but it doesn't interest me as much I've never been drawn to trying to find someone who was alive in the 13th century because yes someone would have been I'm here today aren't I so that is a fact no Um, I completely agree much more interested in what was life like at these periods? Why did people move around? What was life like for that particular occupation compared to that occupation? How did these families ever get together? Um, uh, particularly the stuff that sits outside of inherited memory through family stories or photo albums. 
you know, it's, it's that hinterland, isn't it, between the records that survive that give you just enough to make those speculative assumptions about life versus that bit further back or that bit closer where we feel we can't really find much more or we can actually know an awful lot. I, I like exploring those those margins, those edges. No, I completely I completely agree. I think I think, yeah, you, you can be in real danger of just getting a long list of names and dates. And I think it's, it's definitely the stories that that bring it to life and, and that, you know, keep you interested. What how important do you think understanding the places where your ancestors lived is to to family history? Well, it, it's, it's critical. I mean, th this is why I see it much more as personal heritage rather than family history or local history or house history. They, they intercombine because you're using the same sources, but what is a person without the place that shaped them, framed them, um, gave birth to them, employed them, buried them? You know, it's just a name. Equally, without people, places are just a collection of buildings and fields. You have to bring them back together. You have to understand the social context. You have to see the interplay between that very local pattern of life and the bigger picture stuff that may disrupt it at various times. You have to understand the socioeconomic push-pull of why people would move around or the impact of communication networks on those places. You can't do one without the other. You have to interlink them. Otherwise, you can't tell those stories, can you? You can't understand. You can't see the impact history has had. You can't understand the link between today and more recent history. It's just a little bit, you know, disconnected and, and therefore flat and irrelevant. I completely agree. And at the moment, it's quite difficult to personally go and visit certain places or, or anywhere to a certain degree, depending on where you are at the moment. Um, what influence do you think the pandemic is going to have on, um, on, on genealogy? I'm really fearful, actually, um, not just for genealogy, but also the way that we partake our history. And there's always been an overfocus on the collections that we can view online. And with access to archives diminishing and money draining out of the sector, therefore making it much harder to get both access and new material digitized, particularly the stuff that isn't name rich. I really feel that we're going to be going back to the old days of simply building family trees and relying overly on DNA and miss out on the stories. It's very much genealogy, not family history. Um, I, I am genuinely concerned about losing access to historic material, not just in terms of being able to go to an archive, but also losing the skills people need to transcribe or interpret that material, both from our side of the fence as users, but also the archivists um, with the funding cuts. Are they going to be able to do more cataloguing? Are they going to be able to learn some of the um, language skills and the paleographic and diplomatic skills to interpret some of the older material? Are we going to have time to write those fantastic collection notes which explain where stuff has come from and how it was used? We're probably not. And I think, you know, we are That's facing a real different. crisis in the archive sector, which, of course, is going to impact on the way we research. Um, yet equally, I think there's a very exciting future around some of the data and some of the technology that's coming in around how we can link sources together. And I was talking at Roots Tech, uh, well, the year before last, around some of the big data projects and the partnerships with higher education, whereby we might be looking at the user submitted family trees as one data set and the data that's been provided from third parties, such as, you know, civil registration is another and the DNA and how we then intertwine that, I think is going to be fascinating. And there's some really big projects out there, I think, anthropological projects waiting to be funded based on our research, our data sets and some of that DNA. So I think there's, there's an interesting tension around where we could go compared to where we might be heading. And there's also, I think, something around the future proofing of genealogy. What are we doing for generations to come? What's the legacy content that we're going to create? And I don't think we've even scratched the surface around how we manage our social media outputs, our digital lives, mm. all of the stuff we now commit to the cloud rather than to, uh, you know, a, a paper repository mm. of family memories. And, you know, that's something else we need to wrestle with as a community, I think. It's really interesting, actually. We, funny enough, I was on a, a on a webinar about the the future of uh, digital newspapers, which are probably my all time favourite resource. I love newspapers. I spend days in them. Um, 
and we, we, were, we were talking about this fantasy kind of utopia world where people could um, tag their ancestors within the newspapers, they could link it to different records, you could link it to catalogue descriptions in the archives, you could link them places to maps and, and this kind of whole universe that could be mapped around just one resource for us as a starting point, you know, so yeah. Fingers crossed. I think <laughs> newspapers linked with some of the cartographic sources. You know, I, I'm a great fan of the 1910 Valuation Office Survey, which combines the maps with the field books, with the data about the individual owners and occupiers, which, of course, given its date, links straight into the 1911 census. There are projects like Layers of London that have tiled different historic maps, and then you start to get new data sources accruing to them. There's some great projects, I think, out there, but I just love those newspapers. Like, I'm with you on that one. It's, it's probably the favourite resource that I've used the least. Yeah. Um, but I need to go and spend a lot of time exploring them. Ironically, because of the research that I did on Henry Victor Fuller, I spent a lot of time going through US directories, US, US newspapers and trying to find some of his life story. So, yeah, a lot of great fun. You, in you've talked a lot about um, all the great things you can find um, in genealogy. Do you, do you think now is a good time to, for people to get started? What would you say to anyone who's on the fence about looking into family history? I think we're at one of those moments um, where once in a generation something happens that future generations will look back on and say, well, what were you doing during the pandemic of 2020, 2021? And so I think it's useful to think about not just the research back in time. There's, there's never a bad time to start, particularly if we are distanced from relatives, we're using more technology to record those moments and conversations, you know, so we can create that historic archive for the future. But we can also start to look at what memories we want to preserve. So I'd see it as, a, as an opportunity to do both things, future-proof our lives today, as well as start that incredible journey to contextualize where we've come from. Thank you, Nick. I think that's a brilliant place to, to finish there, to encourage people to pick up not only their family history, but start recording their own, their own memories right now, as we're living through history very much at the moment. <laughs> then thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much for chatting. Really, really enjoyed it. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit subscribe or visit me at www.genealogystories.co.uk.